Hold up, I, I just gotta get this set up, and then we can start the interview. Um, I think, I think Scar just told you, uh, I, I forgot what he just said, uh, I think he said you click on your profile picture, and your profile, like you gotta go to your profile menu, it's, it took me a little bit to figure it out too, actually. Like in the actual chat window? Uh, no, there's like a separate profile page. I think, it's, it's weird. Hey, what we're saying right now is broadcasting, dude. <laughs> yeah, I kind of had put it up live to, like, make an announcement, and then you called. <laughs> so I figured, figured, okay, let's just, figured, be entertaining for everybody. <laughs> oh, it's totally entertaining, because I'm, like, totally lost trying to navigate the site right now. <laughs> I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> Do you want to see where I can click on my picture and I'm like totally lost? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Yeah, um, there's this little tab, like there's a there's a search bar, and then to the left of that is like your profile and if you click on that it'll take you to your page and then you can update your banner and your profile picture yeah I don't see any of that oh well I guess uh, as long as people can see who I am I mean I I can't see what I'm typing but it's all good no worries yeah I think everybody can see your, your username so it should, it should be fine so uh How's it, how's it going, man? Uh, not bad, man. I am just chilling out. I was looking forward to uh, this interview tonight. So, first and foremost, thank you. I appreciate you uh, giving me a chance to come on here and uh, rap for a little while. No problem, man. It's an honor, actually. Uh, what, what plans does Clank have for 2018? World domination. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, we are putting the finishing touches on uh, the, we have a remix album that's coming out, because uh, actually last year we released two albums, first thing we've done in a long time. Uh, we released The Rise, which is a full length, and then we released um, the Metal Missionary soundtrack for the documentary, uh, a guy named Bruce Moore, a good friend of mine, uh, asked us to do the score, the soundtrack for it. Um, so what we did was we figured we would do a remix EP, you know, grab a bunch of the songs on Rise, remix them, manipulate them, you know, make alternate versions and stuff. And uh, so we have some remixes. We have a bunch of new songs and a cover song or two, which will probably uh, make its way onto it as well. We're still finalizing everything. I think we're like, you know, I don't know, it's maybe 80% done or something like that, so. It's awesome. We've, we've always kind of worked in our own time frame, so <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse, you know. But, uh, but we're excited. We're really, really stoked on the mixes that we've done. We also reached out to a handful of uh, friends of ours to have them do some remixes, too. So what we're thinking on maybe doing is... Um, Releasing the remix album and then uh, right after that comes out, giving people like a download link and they can maybe download like, you know, another four or five remixes done by our friends for free or something. We're still trying to figure out exactly how we're going to work it out logistically, but yeah, that's what we're thinking. Awesome, man. Um, yeah. On the remix album... Uh, are the remixes going to be from the band themselves? Or are they going to be from other bands? Or what's the plan with that? What it is is we, we did a bunch of remixes. Um, I recently moved to Dallas, Texas, and the rest of the guys are uh, in California. So before I left, we already knew that we were going to do this remix EP. So we sat in the studio, um, oh man, night after night for a couple of months, picking the songs you wanted to do and then making 
you know, ripping them apart, changing arrangements, and doing a bunch of stuff. So that way, on the remix EP that we released, this will be the remixes that we did of those songs, some, you know, a cover song or two, and uh, some uh, brand new songs as well. And in addition to that, we reached out to a couple other friends and bands and had them, you know, we said, hey, what songs do you want to do? Uh, we, we gave them kind of pick of the litter, so to speak, so they could pick whatever song they wanted to um, uh, use and abuse of ours. So, uh, so basically, it'll be almost be like getting two remix releases in a sense, you know, just because we have our our reinterpretations and then some of our friends' reinterpretations too. So we're pretty stoked on it. We're really digging how everything's coming out so far. That's awesome, man. Um. Earlier, uh, when we were in private message, uh, you mentioned that you have an upcoming side project with one of your fellow bandmates from Clank called Synth Pop Lullaby. Uh, what kind of sound can we expect from that project? Um, Synth Pop Lullaby is, first and foremost, there's no heavy and no aggression whatsoever. Uh, that's a project that actually Pat, uh, Pat Savidio and myself have been working on this. It's funny because this project is about 20 years in the making. Like 20 years ago, we released the song on a compilation, and then we just, you know, like I said, we're slow. We just take things our own time frame. But um, that was another thing we worked on before I left California. And uh, it's basically like, picture like Depeche Mode meets God Lives Underwater. So it's very, it's very electronic, very loop, and like loop-based. Um, old school analog synths, Fat 808, like really cool, um, melodic vocals, no heavy, no, like I said, no heavy, no aggression. You know, it's really cool. Um, and it was, it was cool. It was just really cool to work on. And finally we, you know, we finally basically got off our butts and, uh, kicked it into high gear. And so once the remix album is done and comes out, Probably within two months or so following that, since Pop Lullaby will make its uh, debut on that. I don't know how, if you're, uh, how, how familiar you are with Depeche Mode, but uh, we did a, a, actually a cover of a Depeche Mode song uh, that's coming out on there too. So we're really, we're really excited because it's a little different. You know, it's a little break from our our usual norm of, of heavy and aggression. So we're stoked on it. That's cool. Uh, what Depeche Mode song did you guys cover? Um, the song is called It's No Good. That's like one of my... It's funny because it's one of my favorite songs. It's one of Pat's favorite songs. Because we're just like huge Depeche Mode fans. And uh, we actually had worked on that one in 2010. And we had it uh, <laughs> sitting around. And we never released it. We were going to like surprise release it as a single. And then we just kind of sat on it. And then we just said, you know what? It's time to like, you know get our act together and uh, get full force with a lot of this stuff. So now we're finally going to release a bunch of this stuff. You know, so we're excited. So this will be like, you know, our label, uh, we started our own label like 20 years ago called Smoke Dog Productions. So this will be another year for us to put out, you know, two two releases right off the bat with that. Um, plus Pat himself has been working on like this really chill, electronic side project he does he called it elemento so that's going to be coming at some point later in the year so this is going to be a big year for smoke dog production as a whole new clank brand new clank debut release from uh Sim pop lullaby or stl for short and uh pat elemento so we're pretty stoked i might even before the end of the year try to squeak in a clanky elosis solo release i'm kicking around some ideas so we'll have to wait and see <laughs> it's killer, man. Yeah, we like to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> we like to fog ourselves down with a lot of stuff at one time. <laughs> what events inspired the band to make the album rise? Uh, life, actually. Um, rise, is, rise is like, there's a lot of continuing themes on Rise, like continuing as far as... Um, Continuing with the, the, what Clank is and what always, Clank always was, which was real life lyrics, uh, based on real life experiences, um, how I see life, how my band might, bandmates see life, how we deal with it, uh, how life affects those around me. So like, 
you know, rises a lot about like perseverance, uh, never giving up. You know, there's a lot of subjects on that album, like uh, the rise, the title track. You know, like never giving up. You know, that whole like you know, we might get knocked down and you might see us crawl, but we're always gonna rise up. Um, songs like Only Human is about our humanity, and basically, no matter it's kind of like no matter what you, um, no matter what kind of possessions you get or treasures here. You don't get to take any of it when you die. So a lot of it's like frivolous. So like people, it's all about money, it's all about cars, it's all about bling and whatever crap they're into. It's like, at the end of the day, you can't take any of that with you. So, um, songs like, you know, um, The Thief Within is about suicide. Um, you know, because, uh, I mean, personally, like, we, um, I know like eight people during my lifetime that have taken their own life, which sucks because it sucks when people get to that point where they're so just burnt out on life and they're in such a bad place that they you know they, they look to suicide as as a solution and it sucks you know and that's like real life stuff like that is what basically kind of keeps clank chugging away you know things we all of a sudden we get a, you know we might sit on stuff and not record anything for a while and then all of a sudden we'll get really inspired and then boom you know, so yeah, crazy. <laughs> Speaking of the beast within, um, what made you guys figure out what you wanted to do to craft a uh, a music video for the song? Oh, well, the best part about that is a good friend of ours. His name is Anthony Herrera. Um, he's done the um, our uh, music videos for Rise album artwork, and he also did the Urban Warfare, which came out the last album before Rise in 2012. Um, we played the song, you know, we, I, we sent him the song to check out and stuff, and, and we said, man, we want to do a video, but we kind of wanted to approach that, like, with kid gloves, you know, like, really delicate, because it's a hard subject, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, uh, we, we wanted to basically take the subject and do it right, so... We, we brought it to Anthony, and Anthony said, right, let's kick some ideas back and forth, and then he kind of came up with a concept of, hey, here's a guy who's struggling, you know, he's, all his bills are coming, you know, because you watched it earlier today, right? Yeah, it's a good video. Yeah, like, yeah, man, basically, like, if you, like, when you're watching the video, like, the dude's kind of suffering, you know, like, it's kind of like he's just having one of those days, he's arguing with this girl, he gets pulled over, he's running late to work, he's got, like, a mailbox full of past due bills, and he's just having the crappiest day ever, and he's stressed out. And by the end of the video, you know, he's in, in the backyard, like, getting ready to kill himself. And it's like having, you know, a, a friend come to him and talk to him and just kind of theoretically uh, talk him off the ledge, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we wanted to, particularly in that video, too, what we wanted to do is memorialize people that we have lost. Like, um, you know, our guitar player, Pat, one of his best friends growing up, um, had taken his own life. A kid that I that lived right next door to me had taken his life. And yeah, I was like 16 years old when this happened. Uh, so we put the word out online and said, "Hey, look, we're going to do this video, and we want to memorialize some people that we've lost. So if you want to be a part of this and have your loved one a part of this, send us, you know, send me a message with their vital information, like the name, you know, uh, year of birth, year of passing." And then that's like what you see scroll through the chorus in that video, all those pictures. And there was a few people that were no pictures for, so there was names uh, and dates listed up there. And that was our way of, you know, uh, trying to get that across to people. And if you notice, too, there's lots of facts on there, statistics about suicide, how many people die from depression, and where it, uh, you know, where it takes them, how many people succumb to it a day, a year. Uh, so then if you look to it, the, by the end, there's the contact information for like the suicide hotline and stuff. I mean, when we first, when Anthony first met us the rough cut, I mean, all of us watched it, like the hair on our arms stood up and I, I, I'm not gonna lie, man, I cried like the first, I don't know, 30 times I saw it, I just couldn't, I just kept crying, I just couldn't help it. You know, so it was, it, 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 and it, it the thing is, it was stirring. It wasn't graphic. We didn't want to, you know, make it bad for anybody, but it was very, 
uh, moving, like a lot of people said. And all the people that, you know, commem- we commemorated their loved one in there, they contacted us and they were like, dude, thank you so much. We love what you did. Thank you for letting us be a part of this. And for us, that was like the least we can do, you know, especially from knowing people who's passed. Because whether you know somebody yourself that's taken their own life, chances are, if you don't know somebody, you know somebody who knows somebody. It's that much of a an epidemic in our society and it, it sucks. We just want people to know that, you know, they don't, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, they, there yeah. are alternatives. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, I had my page pulled down. I was trying to answer some, some questions in the chat. Yes, I... I was browsing the, I'm browsing the chat. I'm watching my phone blow up like a disco club right now. <laughs> Text messages, you know, trying to notifications going on. Yeah, uh, just a just a note to everybody in the chat room. I am taking questions, so feel free to ask Clank whatever you want. Don't forget to tip your waitresses. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what song from Rise has the most meaning to you? Would you say that the making of Rise helped you and your bandmates deal with the struggles of life? Oh, uh, absolutely. You know why? Because first and foremost, uh, the music of Clank, we always refer to it as sonic therapy. Some people sit on a couch and speak to a shrink, which is totally fine. I don't have the money or the benefit for that. So for many years, um, me and the guys, but this is pretty much how we spent, we vent our frustration. Um, Rise, you know, Rise is a great example of, um, put, you know, putting our frustrations out there. But also, if you notice too, our lyrics are very transparent. They're very, they're very honest and real and relatable. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's crazy too when you're writing something that sometimes you get an idea for the melody and, the, and, and like the lyrics first. Then sometimes you get the music and then you're just kind of sitting there going, huh, well, we have this music, so what are we going to do with it? You know, so we yeah we try to think we try to think about this and like where we're gonna go with it. And it's it's funny because I mean you can't just say all right write a song about world hunger or peace or whatever politics. I just I can't you know it's not like you can throw a subject matter at me. I, it has to kind of come from the feeling of the music, from the vibe of the music, which is always bizarre because I'll sit there, you know, Pat Pat will be sitting there with the control board like looking at me like okay anytime you want to start singing I'm like dude I don't know what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then sometimes it's just like, bam, you know, like there's a, there's actually a song on the, on the remix EP that's coming out, I'll give you the name of it, it's called History, and it's about the history of the band, and it kind of originally started as a joke, and this is just to show how, like, way life works out, is, um, he was playing a song that we've had uh, around for a while, and he's like, oh, it's too bad we never did anything with this, so, uh, you know, I was listening to it, and all of a sudden, like, these lyrics just back, back, back started coming to me, and I was kind of like, uh, uh, like freestyling it. <laughs> if that's even a good, that's even a good term, you know. Just sitting there, kind of like flowing. I had the joke. I was spitting out stuff, and he's like, "Oh my god, dude, that's so brilliant. We need to get that on tape." So he like hit record. We did a scratch of it, and then um, I thought like the next day or a few days later, we 
did the actual full version of the song, and it was it was awesome. You know, so uh, that's one of the ones that you get to look forward to on the new album. Uh, so that's, oh, that's yeah. the only little hint that I'll give you. It's called History, <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny too. It's it's kind of it's a joke song, but it's not a joke song. It's it's definitely got humor in it because. You know, and especially in the music business, you gotta have a sense of humor because you're just so used to getting banged up and beat up by people, metaphorically, you know, contracts, uh, promoters, you know. It's like if you're yeah. a musician and you're, or you've done any kind of art, you, you're a glutton for punishment in one way or another because people will always mock you, people will, you know, rip on your work, everyone's a critic, everyone thinks they know how to do everything you do better, you know, it just comes with the territory, so it is what it is. <laughs> Uh, how did uh, you and your bandmates come up with the score for the Metal Missionaries documentary? Um, Bruce Moore, the guy who set it up, actually had sent it over and said, hey, there you go, try to come up with some stuff around it. So Pat had it running through, um, I believe it was Pro Tools, and we were sitting there, it was originally Pat and I were sitting there just uh, trying to get some ideas together. He had the movie on one screen, and then on the other screen, like the uh, uh, the tracks, like the record what we were going on. So we were just like, man, let's try to figure something out. And some of, some things he had like a, a drum, he had like a drum beat, or like a, 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 a like a loop of some kind, or some little drum programming. And he said, hey, I got, I was working on this. What do you think about this? So I would sit there and try to add some guitar to it. And then there was some other parts where it was like, you know what? This is about the history of extreme uh, Christian music. That's what this documentary was based about. So it was like, man, if it's going to be about extreme music, let's make some of it extreme. So I was like, part of me was like, I want to write the craziest riffs, the fastest riffs, and then like, you know, really crazy picking, like, <laughs> like really syncopated pitching. So we plugged in the guitar to his like Black Star and... Uh, was just out just messing around playing with riffs and then he was programming along and then we just kind of keep it it's funny because that was the first thing we ever did where we actually had a deadline because we've had our own studio since you know the late 90s uh so it's not like you're paying for studio time and a producer so it's a blessing and a curse because you could take forever <laughs> Like, like we do, <laughs> like, you know, Urban Warfare, I think we took two years to record it. We took like a year or so to make Rise. Like I said, we're, we're, we're perfectionists, so a lot of times we kind of drag our feet just because, you know, it can always be better, yeah. you know, but that's what we, that's what we did with the soundtrack, and then we got to the point where we had a lot of stuff sketch, sketched out, and then we said to Eric, hey, we're all set for you to do some drum stuff, so he came in, and it was like, he cut like 22 tracks in one day. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was insane because, uh, because some of it, like, he, like, we had been showing him what we were working on up to that point. But then it was like the last, I think, two or three songs we did were just kind of off the cuff. So he, we kind of like threw it at him. So he was like, all right, I'm going to need a second. You know, he went into the garage, kind of pumping through his headphones, you know, messed around a little bit, and then, like, I told you the very last song on that is called Coda. If you listen to that song, Eric just goes complete bat crap crazy, like, on the drums. Like, it's just, like, he got done with the, the with the take that he was the most happiest with, and he goes, so what do you guys think? And we're like, dude, come inside. And when he came inside, we were like, oh, dude. Like, oh, my God. Like, it was so heavy. It was so heavy it hurt, you know? It was just that awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. That was a very fun experience, and we're looking forward to hopefully scoring some other, you know, movies and stuff in the near, in the future. Yeah, that'd be awesome, man. When did you form Clank, and what was it like in the first few years of the band? Um, I was playing with a band called Circle of Dust, um, and Clayton had actually given me, uh... Well, it was, it was Jason that gave me the nickname Clank, and that was in 1993. We were in Virginia on tour, and it just kind of happened. I was given the nickname because I was a joking metal guy. <laughs> I was <laughs> in the band. I was chasing the promoter's kid around the house, and 
the guy looked at trip me as a joke and Jason was like, dude, you can't do that, man. This guy's so metal that he'll clank when he hits the ground. And then the name, the name, I know it's not like the funniest story, but that's where the name clank came from. And then I was like, I kept saying, man, I'm going to do like a total psycho death metal side project and I'm just going to call it clank. And it clank originally was going to be like super crazy, just death metal with guttural vocals. But then I was like, you know what? I don't want to, uh, I don't want to just be stuck in and pigeonholed into one thing. I kind of wanted Clank to be basically, uh, like, um, a blank canvas. Clank can be any, you know, I didn't want it to have to fit one, fit in one box. It, it can be heavy, Clank can be mellow, Clank can be very melodic, Clank can be total, like, total <laughs> vocals, you know, and it could, or it could have six vocal harmonies. It all depend, you know, it could, be, it could be super electronic or it could be really stripped down and just aggro. Um, and it all started actually with a demo of a song, Animosity, that I wrote in 1993. And then in December of 94, I made like a, uh, a slightly better version of the demo. And Circle of Dust label at the time, REX Music, um, they asked, they said, hey, can we take this? And I was like, sure. So they put it on two different compilations. And sent it literally like all over the globe because they had a pretty decent following. So in a, essentially, it kind of helped me uh, kickstart Clank because in the very beginning it was just you know it was just myself. But I had known Pat because when I was doing Circle of Dust shows, Pat was with a band called Toxic Shock. Yeah. Um, so it's funny because I would be Pat and I would literally see each other like every freaking time there was a show at the Roxy. I was there and Pat was there, always giving out, always giving out flyers. And we'd be like, yo, what's up, dude? What's up, dude? And we just became friends and we started hanging out. And then um, after a circle, uh, bit the dust, so to speak, and I uh, <laughs> started working on Quake, it was like the album was done. And it was like, okay, now I need to go out and start doing shows because people started off on shows. And I talked to Pat and Pat was like, hey, man, I'm not, you know, I'm not playing the Toxic anymore. I'm totally way into electronic music, and uh, I want to do this, and I want to be a part of it. So, you know, that was that was the initial path, and I, since the get-go, and Eric used to play drums in a band. They were a rap core band called Everyday Life, also known as EDL back in the day. So, uh, I mean, I did some festivals, and I knew him. Uh, so Eric came into the fold, and... That's <laughs> the rest has been a uh, the rest has been history. It's <laughs> awesome. Speaking of circle, yeah, of, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> Speaking of circle of dust, most of the history, especially the bits of the history of the band involving you, are shrouded in mystery. Would you mind shedding some light on your time with Circle of Dust? Uh, circle of Dust is the first real band that I was in. I know um, I've been referred to as just a quote-unquote hired guy or live guy, which wasn't necessarily the case. I mean, when I first came in, I was just playing guitar, but um, that was, you know, over, over the years, I took on a bigger role instead of just playing guitar. I mean, I, I started with a mailing list. I started, uh, I basically wanted to help Clayton out, you know, take some of the stress off him, uh, you know, so I was, I was basically like, I started booking shows, booking tours, I started making all the, um, letterhead and the correspondence for the, uh, fan, fan mail, um, like I said, started a mailing list and then started dealing with t-shirt distributors and then banking, you know, putting money in, anytime we got orders, I would mock everything in our books and put it in the bank, so, I mean, I know, I know most people just go, oh yeah, you were just the live guy. And I'm like, no, I wasn't the live guy to the point where in 1994, I got the Circle of Dust logo tattooed in the center of my shoulders. Um, and I, I mean, no higher guy, especially who really wasn't getting paid, would do something like that. Yeah. Uh, because I believed in Circle of Dust and I believed in the music that we played. And yes, I didn't write any of it and stuff, but um, Clayton and I have been friends for many years, like since we were kids and... Um, it was a great experience for me, you know, uh, being a part of it and helping to, uh, <laughs> to launch 
what Clank later became. Because, I mean, my, I always loved, like, the Pest Mode and some, what used to be considered alternative bands back then, but Clayton was the one that got me into Ministry and Nine Inch Nails and, you know, so, I mean, well, for me, it was like, all of a sudden, I was like, wow, dude, you can have heavy guitars and this electronic stuff. It was like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, so it, it basically, like, my musical horizons were just like, it was like, mind blown. <laughs> There's so much. You know, the possibilities are endless. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean, it even got to the point where, like, at one point, you know, our label, REX Music, was pretty much going downhill, and they owed us a lot of money, and they never, they didn't follow through on a lot of promises, and Clay was just like, one day we went out, I'll never forget, we went out to Chili's, and he said, hey, look, you know what, this has been fun, but I'm just going to put Circle of Dust to bed, and we're going to not do this anymore, basically, you know, Circle of Dust is over and done with, and... I mean, honestly, I was crushed. I was crushed for a long time because that was, you know, towards the end, Circle of Dust started to get a lot of radio airplay, and we were getting, like, really big. Our tours were getting better. In the very beginning, I mean, our very first tour, we went away for, I think, 25 days, and I came home with $33. And I was like, yes! I made money on the road! I didn't pay any of my bills, but I didn't give a crap. I was like, dude, I was playing on stage, and it was like what I've always wanted to do. You know, and I was playing the music that I love to play with my friends, you know, so... Yeah, that's awesome. By the time, yeah, by the time it ended, I mean, like, dude, we sold out the Masquerade in Atlanta, uh, upstairs, which is, dude, like a 1,000 or 1,200 people, and then we used to play, like, there in Florida, like, every four months religiously, so, um, you know, it was, and it was a little, it was a little rough, because I saw, like, in the, in the, um, I saw earlier somebody had asked in the... I want to say in the event page, like, you know, what was one of the challenges with getting Clank going in the beginning? And it would have been after the end of Circle of Dust, trying to get to that point where, okay, I was doing, I wanted, you know, I started doing Clank as a side project, but I needed to kind of dust myself off, um, get back up on my feet, and actually put one foot in front of the next and say, okay, well, I'm actually going to pursue doing this Clank thing now. And, uh, and that was, you know, that was big for me because it was, I don't know if you've ever heard of a band, they were from Cleveland, they were called Six Feet Deep. They were some friends of ours that were signed to REX Records and their guitar player couldn't do some tours. So right after Circle of Dust broke up, um, the drummer, Tom, had hit me up and said, hey dude, we've got like two months worth of shows booked. Is there any way you would be interested in coming to Ohio, learning these songs and just kind of toggling back and forth whenever we have these shows and these runs and I said okay so basically Six Feet Deep was the in between Circle of Dust and Kicking Off Clank they're the ones who got me back on stage it's awesome and it was cool because yeah that kind of like refreshed my um, you know re- relit that that pilot light that fire under me to do music again you know so because yeah, when things went down with Circle like I said I was just I was so beat mentally I was like man this is my chance this is my one chance but once, you know, I got my, my head back on straight and everything, it was like, well, now I have total free reign to do what I want to do with Clank and make it whatever that vision is it's supposed to be. And since since day one, when I started it myself, till now, with all these years later, with, like, uh, Pat and Eric, it's like, we still do, you know, we, we, we're still, we still have no limits. Whatever we feel like we want to do, we do. And we like to do it, you know, we're a little picky. You know, we like to do it the way we do it. And, uh, you know, when you listen to something, you, you'll always know it's Clank. It might have some elements yeah. and some other things in it, but it'll never sound like anybody else per se because we try not to, you know, we, it's good to have influences, but you don't want to, you know, um, personify somebody. You like so much when you sound like them. Not in our case, you know. Yeah. Um, what was it like working on the Argyle Park track Head Screw and the uh, the uh, Silhouette of Rage track from the AP2 album? The um, Head Screw was recorded in Clay's basement where we used to play with Circle. That was fun because he was like, because like I said, that was around the time when I was, uh, uh, when Clay, that was, be- I want to say that was before... Oh man, this is testing my brain power right now. Because I don't remember, 
exactly when that came out. I think that came out before it's still suffering. So I think I don't specifically claim it was like Clinton and Buka, but I feel like I wanted to do like the real gruff, guttural vocals on that. And it was cool because Mark Solomon from the Crucified did the other vocals with me. And then a couple of years later when they did AP2, uh, Buka and Level came to me and said, hey, we're doing this song, Silhouette of Rage, and we would really love you to do it. But this time it's just going to be just you, no other vocalist. I was like, oh, man, no pressure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. And it was, uh, it was, re- it was a lot of fun. Um, and it's one of those things that I just, um, I get to look back and smile because it's in, in the, I guess you could say like my repertoire or whatever, my, my musical, what's the word, my musical resume of stuff I've done that I'm really proud of, you know, cool to do some things for, for old friends, old friends. And to this day, I mean, the Off and Off Park stuff just got re-released. Clayton just released that. I know he released a bunch of the Circle of Dust stuff too. So I'm just glad that here it is 20 years later that people are still getting a chance to hear that stuff and they're actually still liking it, you know? Yeah. It makes me really proud whenever people say, hey man, I, one of my favorite songs is, you know, this one you sang or this appearance you did there. And I mean, for me as a musician, it makes me feel, as a human being, I feel good inside, you know, but as a musician, it's, it's kind of like that little, that little nod of the hat, that little pat on the back, which makes you feel good at the end of the day. You're like, oh, yeah, it's good, you know? It's cool to do what you do, but it's cool to know that some people still appreciate it and like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of, Clayton and his recent uh, activity with Circle of Dust. What do you think of his new Circle of Dust material? I only heard the one song, The Machines of Grace or something, which was kind of cool. It just sounded more like a heavy version of Cell Dweller. It didn't necessarily, to me, sound 100% Circle of Dusty, but it was definitely heavier than any of the stuff I know he had done. Because I, I haven't really followed much of it, but, you know, there's always people that'll just send me a link and say, hey, have you heard this? Have you heard this? Have you heard this? Um, but I, I, the song was pretty cool. It was, it was kind of heavy. Yeah. Um, Rappy Garber in the chat room wants to know, what was the most challenging part of getting still the Still Suffering album to be made, and what obstacles did you face on getting it released? <laughs> Well, like what I was saying before, the whole the transition from from Circle of Death ending to actually getting the, um, I don't want to say the balls, but getting the, basically getting the transition from, from the end of Circle to actually saying, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to jump forward, and I'm going to proceed with this, you know, um, that was definitely a, a hurdle trying to get over, and then it was, I had a lot of music, but I wasn't sure what to do lyrically, you know, because a yeah. lot of stuff was, um, uh, you know, like, they like had music, but then, like I said earlier, like, I have to wait for, I can't pick a song's subject matter, I have to wait for something to jump out at me, so, I mean, it's like, I know Rocky's one of his favorite songs is Disease, and that song is actually, um, is also about suicide, a, a bunch of our songs on and off are about suicide, because, I was in, that was basically documenting a really, really rough point in my life where I was at right after high school where yeah. I was kind of lost. I didn't really know what to do. People around me were dying and I was just, you know, I didn't get all through, all through school. I had like maybe five friends. I could count all my friends on one hand. I wasn't Mr. Popularity. I was like 130 pounds, wet and wearing boots, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was an easy target for kids in school, so... You know, I never got put in a locker because I didn't quite fit, but I did, uh, <laughs> it, it was a little rough for me, so, but, you know, and then songs like, um, Leave, Leave is about, um, my parents bitter divorce and the day my mom walked out, like, there's like, one of the lines says, you know, while holding on to her last kiss, I bid farewell and wave my fist, and that was literally about, we were standing at the door, and my mom turned around to sit to my brother and I, well, mom's gotta go, and we're like, go where? She's like, I'm leaving. I gotta go. And we're like, when are you coming back? She's like, never. I'm not. And she wow. gave me and my brother Jimmy a kiss and a hug and she turned around and she walked out the door. And that's why like, like in that song it says open wound, closing door, 
she won't live here anymore. And it says, you know, with tearful eyes at her, I stare, a sorrow that's too much to bear. My heart pulled out before my eyes, a touching way to say goodbye. While holding on to her last kiss, I bid farewell and wave my fist. Where it's like, I'm saying goodbye, but at the same time, I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> no, no. You know, I mean, like, the heart, like, lyrically, I put my heart and soul into that, and all of that is, literally, it's like, like all our songs, it's like a, a page out of a journal or a diary set to music, a.k.a. what we were saying earlier about being sonic therapy. Yeah. You know? And time, time is about my father, my relationship with my dad. But, you know, a lot of, like I said, all these songs go back to real life things that are relatable, that anybody can relate to. You know, relationships, you know, burning is about God, questioning God, like, I know you're there, but where are you? Kind of thing, like, do you exist? You know, there's, um, we all suffer with stuff, and my thing was having a bunch of music written, and then we're like, okay, what am I going to do with this now? You know, that was like, I think come to, at the end of the day, that was the biggest hurdle for me. Was like, okay, now I got a bunch of cool music written, but you know, now I need to get it all done. And I and and um, still something was done in a month. I had literally a month budgeted out of time, so that was really rough too. Because that was you know the debut release. That was like, hey, you're gonna go in and you're gonna do, do like you know like uh, eight ten hours a day of studio time, and then. When you're done recording, you're going to go home and spend another eight to ten hours trying to bang out some lyrics, trying to figure out what you want to say. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it's uh, crazy, but very rewarding, too, because here it is, oh, well, yeah. you know, Still Something, Still Something came out in November of 96, and people are still talking about it, people still listen to it, and that's, you know, that's, it's, it feels great inside just to know that people are actually touched by something that you make and you create, especially... Dude, we, when we play shows and we get letters and uh, especially now through social media, I can't even tell you, man, if I had a dollar for every time someone said that, like, your music was the soundtrack to my adolescence, <laughs> you know, you said everything I wanted to say, like, you looked in my head with a flashlight, but I wasn't able to say it myself, and you said it for me. And that is like, that's hardcore when people say stuff like that to you, you know? It's yeah. Like, Cause, you know, I'm just some schmo who's trying to write music, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with my friends. And for somebody to get something that much out of it is just, you know, it's it's humbling and it's a blessing, too. You know. Yeah. Um. Let's see, R- Rappy Garber also wants to know how did you sign on the two to- on with Tooth and Nails at the time. Uh, <laughs> Rapidly and knucklehead. <laughs> um, I wanted to prove that Tooth and Nail Records that I was serious and I didn't want to be treated as a joke. So I took a knife and I sliced open the palm of my hand and I signed my contract in my own blood. <laughs> wow. That's yeah, crazy. The, the, the average release, you know, I mean, normal, the normal stuff on Tooth and Nail back then was like either hardcore, or like poppy punk rock, which I have nothing against it, but. I just didn't want to be treated like just another run-of-the-mill, you know, uh, punk band or, you know, I wanted to say, hey, man, this is, music is my life. Music is, like, since I was a little kid, music was always my escape, my happy place, my, you know, my center, my chi, if you want to call it, you know? So I wanted them to, uh, to know what it meant to me. And I remember Brandon was on the phone with our friend Buka, who I was sharing a house with at the time, Buka from Argyle Park. And he says, hey, did you get Clank's contract? And he goes, yeah, it just came, FedEx. And he goes, did you look at it? And he goes, no. He goes, take a look at it. So he looked at it, and he said to Buka, and he's like, oh, oh my God. He goes, is this blood? Is this freaking blood? And he's like, yeah. And he goes, oh my God, he signed his, his contract in his own blood. And then Tooth and Nail actually put out a, um, I guess they called it a coffee table book. You know, where, where they put like, you know, artwork and basically like a history of Tooth and Nail Records. And in that book, they put a picture of, of where I signed my contract in, in my blood, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Scarred Hand of Healing in the chat room wants to know if you would be willing to work with Clayton again in the future. I would love to work with Clayton. I was, I, Dude, I've been waiting for my phone to ring to do some Circle of Dust shows. Um, but I haven't spoken to him in many years. 
Um, I tried reaching out here and there on Twitter and stuff, but I, I still love the guy. You know, we grew up together. Um, I have no hate or anything towards him. Uh, I know he's done really well for himself with his label and his music and stuff, and I would, I would love for a chance to get in the studio with him and Pat and Eric and just, uh, you know, if that, if that opportunity ever arose, I'd jump on it. Yeah. You know? Well, if he said he wanted, you know, because I know, I get a lot of messages from people too that say, hey man, I, you know, I really wish you would do some shows with Circle of Dust. I'm like, hey man, I'm not the guy you gotta talk to. My job is very, what's the word I'm looking for? My job is very flexible. And my boss is really cool, so if something comes up musically, all I need to do is just let him know when I need to take off. So my schedule can be cleared real easily. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, to me, uh, I don't know what happened, but the chat room just went completely black on my computer. <laughs> yeah. I said, the web page is running, slowing down your browser. Oh, joy. <laughs> <laughs> DJ Thunderous in the chat room wants to know, uh, where in the world would you want to play? Oh, man. Where in the world? Um, we've never, I, sadly, we've never been out of the United States. We really wanted to go to Germany. Uh, we, want, we, we really wanted to go to Europe really bad, but I, I want to be able to say I played, like, Australia. Like, I want to play, like, you know, the the Opry House or whatever that place is that looks really funky on the water that's over there. <laughs> Just that way I could be like, me and my bandmates, we took 24-hour plane ride to play across the globe. I want to play, you know, I pretty much love to play anywhere, but if I could play someplace really far, you know, if we could do like, you know, Japan, Asia, Europe, man, sky's the limit. I mean, from anybody who wants to book it, we will come. Just book it and pay us. <laughs> <laughs> Cover our plane ticket. We're there. <laughs> um, Robert Murray wants to know, uh, what was your most interesting non-music job? <laughs> He's only saying that because he used to work with me at Ringling Brothers. I was, uh, tr I was a transportation manager and a show uh, welder and fabricator there. Uh, I worked there for eight years, actually. And that's actually where I met Robert, a.k.a. Big Show, as we used to call him. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, that's definitely the most unique job because I lived on a train. We all lived on a train and we traveled pretty much 52 weeks a year on a train. And we used to say it was the unjob because you would, you know, you'd work in Maine, you'd go to sleep on the train and then you'd wake up and you'd be in Florida and then you'd work in Florida and then you'd go to sleep and then you'd, you know, wake up on the train in like St. Louis. You know, so it was it was definitely an interesting definitely an interesting job, to say the least. Um Cisco might might not have uh been in here earlier, he might have tuned in late, but he wants to know what is your next project. Uh, I'm sorry, can I, who say again? Cisco thirteen in the chat room wants to know what your next project is. Ooh. I wonder if that's my buddy Cisco here from Dallas. Um, next musical project, well, we're finishing up, finish up the Clank Remix EP, and then actually, um, I'm hoping by at some point this year I'd like to drop at least one single, a, uh, Clank Teolosa thing. I have a couple of different things in my head. This is the problem. I have so many things spinning around at once that I don't know what to focus on first. <laughs> I have like a cool acoustic project idea. I have a really cool stripped down thing that I, I, I already reached out to a friend of mine to play piano on, uh, which will be totally different and out of my normal comfort zone, but that's, I believe people should put themselves in an uncomfortable position, especially in music, to try different things. Um, and actually, I, I have been working on some music with some friends here, my friend Caleb and my friend Elijah. Um, it's, it's, it's a little different. It's metal. It's like, sort of symphonic um it's it's a little more melodic not so much electronic and industrial i cut some vocals on a demo of a song so far we've just been kind of dragging our feet with that because you know everybody has life going on right now you know life seems to take precedence over things sometimes but um as far as that just you know 
I, I'm, uh, I wanted to keep some some new, some different music things flowing. I, I, I like to try everything. I want to collaborate with anyone and everyone. Yeah. I don't care if it's jazz. I don't care if it's rock. Um, you know, I I want to try different things. I, just because it's always every time you do something different, you learn. Yeah. You know, you might learn what to do and also what not to do. But I mean, and plus it's it's the universal language of music. You know, I mean. And, and what it comes down to is, like, I like pretty much everything from ABBA to Frank Zappa. You know, like, people go, oh, well, I only listen to heavy music, or I only listen to this, or I only listen to that. And I'm like, why would you be so musically pig-headed or have, like, you know, blinders on? Because, yes, pop is not everyone's favorite. Because, you know, top 40 stuff on the radio can get a little bubble gummy and stuff here and there. But at the same point, if you listen to a song on this radio, you, sometimes you can't deny how well a song is written, whether it's the hook or the production value or, you know, like people make fun of Katy Perry. Oh, she's Katy Perry. She's annoying, whatever. Or Lady Gaga. But yeah, but you know what? Lady Gaga's got an amazing voice. Whether you like to admit it or not, her songs are infectious and they get in your skull like an earworm and millions of people play them. It's like, I think you have to be able to appreciate um things outside of your normal musical comfort zone, you know? Yeah. Just just because it's there. I mean, I don't like a lot of country, but I do like country. I, li- I like rap. I love, like, New York hardcore. You know, you should be able to appreciate everything and not, you know, like those people go, oh, I won't listen to anything unless it's thrash metal. I'm like, no, don't be a moron because there's more, there's life beyond thrash metal. You know, and there's life yeah. beyond just rap or there's life beyond top 40 or... You know, I don't know, I just, I'm the youngest of six boys, so, and every one of my brothers is into a different musical style, you know, so, uh, like, one brother's into disco, one brother was into Motown, one brother was into, like, Electric Light Orchestra in Kansas, so, I had all these different things getting shot at me where it was like, I had such a big, vast variety of music to pick and choose from and enjoy, that I think it, you know, it kind of helps open your horizon so you're not stuck you know my forte might be in the heavier stuff but I can appreciate you know you know if you, if you flip through my phone you're going to find King Diamond you're going to find Electric Light Orchestra you're going to find you know um, Kill Switch Engage but you're also going to find like Sade and you're going to find Believer and you know it's, it's, it's good to have a variety yeah like, I know I went off on a tangent on that, but yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I agree, because like, people are like that with metal. Like, There's all these different genres of metal, and you got these this metal elitists who are just like, oh, if you don't listen to death metal, you're not listening to real metal. Yeah, they're purists, and I don't, I'm not down with that. After, and everything these days is, is sub-genre and sub-genre. Like, I only listen to, you know, blackened folk whatever Celtic metal or whatever input weird subgenre they want to put I don't mean if that's what you that's what you're into but the whole thing is you know what you can like Slayer and you can like Madonna too you can like Five Finger Death Punch and uh, you know hate on Nickelback too there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> 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 I say that only in, in jokingly of course but you know what I mean music is just so it's such a vast thing that it just there's, there's music to suit every single mood, no matter what your mood is. So, you know, I mean, enjoy it. You know, it's there for everybody, and everybody makes different types. That's why I want to kind of branch out and try different things. You know, I don't know. I know the heavy fans might not be into it, but the people yeah. who are actual fans of music per se will be more prone to be like, hey, you know what? I might normal. I might not normally like this kind of stuff. But I dig where you're going, and I applaud you for branching out. You yeah, know? that's awesome. It's good to branch out. I think too many people stay in the same spot and don't really progress with their music. It's like they're releasing the same album over and over again. Yeah, you get really stagnant, and that's the thing. Is like we don't want to be uh, we don't want to be stagnant. You know, I mean, with with Clank and personally, that's why. You know, Eric, our drummer, he plays with, like, a stoner doom metal band out in California. He also plays with this other band that has, like, 
you know, like keyboards and like they dress up as mariachi guys and, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, music is too much fun for you to just be stuck in one box. Yeah. You don't, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's a great mindset to approach it with. Well, seriously, and we look at it the same way when we create our music. That's why, you know, you might have super, super, super fast songs that are Clank songs, and then you have other songs like Only Human where they're heavy, but they're they're so melodic where the melody, it's almost like you don't realize how heavy the song is because the chorus might have such a hook or whatever. And that just, you know, and it wasn't planned, it just kind of happens that way. Yeah. Will uh, will Clank be playing any shows in the near future? We are working on that. Um, we're try. I'm trying to set something up. Uh, for like August or September, a run of shows, which would be probably like looking at like uh, if I can, you know, if we can make it happen, like Dallas, maybe Austin, Little Rock. Um, Oklahoma City, maybe Tennessee. It all depends. I, I hate to say it, but it's not like it was in the 90s where everybody only paid like $300 a month in rent. We had like families, um, big, you know, everyone has jobs now, so it's a little harder to just disappear for five months like we used to. We used to all cram in the van. I used to unload all my CDs, you know, tell my landlord, hey, I'm moving out and put all my stuff in storage at a friend's house and we would just hop in a van and disappear for three, four, five months out of a, out a clip. And it, unfortunately these days, we all have a lot, too much, <laughs> we have too much responsibility to do that without have knowing that we're gonna financially make out. And, it, and I don't wanna, you know, I hate to say, well, it's about money, but at the end of the day, we have too much to lose if we go away and we come home completely bankrupt and broke, so. It's all a yeah. matter of promoters wanting to pay, and sadly, these days people don't want to pay. I mean, you can do a show for like five bucks and have like three killer bands, and people go, no, nah, I don't feel like going out. I'll just watch a, a Facebook live stream. You know, where, where, I mean, and you know, when you see live video that's done on Facebook, it sounds like it was recorded in a toilet bowl. You know, it's just yeah. horrible. You know, it is what it is, but some people are just, that's where music has gone these days. It went from, we will drive five, six, seven, eight hours with all our friends in a pack in a car to see a killer show to there's five killer bands playing ten minutes away and I'm not even going to get out of bed. You know, kind of thing. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And, and on, top of the, on top of the technology thing, there's also this, like, certain bands will make you pay to open for them. Or... Well, dude, you know what? Believe it or not, that buying on the tours is actually so common. It, it's horrible. I mean, I can make your head spin with some numbers, but back in the day, you remember like when Ozfest used to be around? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was 90,000, 90, 90, 0, comma, 0, 0, 0. 90,000 dollars to buy on the Ozfest back in the day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, Sometimes you'd be like, bands will be like, oh, well, hey, if we, want to, we need to take a support act out. Okay, well, they can come on tour for X amount. I mean, dude, when we went, when we went to, um, when Circle of Dunk was on tour, we played in Florida, and this dude came out and saw us. He came up after the show. He was like, man, I've never seen music like this. You guys are really good. Um, uh, I, he's like, my name is Kelly. I play bass in a band called Death. I don't know if you've ever heard of us. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, as a bass player for Death, I love Death. You know, and he's like, we're doing this tour, and we would love for you to come on tour with us and open up for us. And they, they at the time, they only wanted $5,000, but it would have been like, I think, a month, a month or a month and a half uh, worth of tour dates. And dude, it would have been like Circle of Death opening up for Death. But at the time, our label was like, well, you can go on tour with Death, or you can make a music video. We don't have it in the budget for you to do both. So at the time, actually, we had, we ended up doing the music video because we that was already kind of already in the works before we were offered the tour. But I mean, and still, that's five thousand dollars isn't 
isn't really that that much. I mean, Pat, our guitar player, I think back in the day, his band Box to Shock, I think they paid ten grand to open for Nuclear Assault. They went away with Nuclear Assault, I think, for like a month or two, and it cost them ten thousand dollars to buy after that. Wow. You know, yeah, it's it's pretty common. You know, I mean, it's I mean, it's on hand. On one hand, it's kind of like, man, that's rough. What do bands do if they don't have money? <laughs> You don't go on tour with bigger bands. That's what happens. <laughs> and, that's, and that's part of the thing, though. The idea is you're getting a chance to go in front of other bands, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the other band's audience. And that's the whole reason why you're trying to open for somebody. It's like, you know, you're cross-pollinating. You get to play in front of their fans and vice versa. You know, so it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't always, doesn't always work out because some bands want an exorbitant amount of money and sometimes it's not a matter of being friends with people once management gets involved it's you know hey uh, you know we really love you to play but our manager says you have to buy on and it's not a matter of just being my friend now so you know but you know the politics even in music the politics is just so frustrating you know it is what it is yeah I can't even begin to Think about how much I would pay to see Circle of Dust and Death at the same show. <laughs> yeah, dude, freaking that was one of those like the day, the day that the day that we ran into uh, Kelly. We we're actually playing in front of a place called um, in Coco Beach, and I was like, I knew the guy was familiar too, and I was just like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? And then when he came up there, was like, oh man, you guys are incredible and this and that. And I was like, oh my god, dude, really? We didn't get a chance to play for freaking death, but it was like, no. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Denied. <laughs> Do you think... Okay, I'm, trying so, sorry. I'm trying so hard to log back into... I'm sorry. I'm trying so hard to log back into the, the chat, but my computer had crashed, and now it keeps saying it, it will not recognize my login info. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Do you think things would have played out a little differently for Circle of Dust if they had gone on tour with Death? Eh, I don't know. If the label didn't make all the stupid decisions they did and go bankrupt, that was that was one of the major reasons why. Because it was like, we were relying yeah. on them for tour support and stuff, and then all of a sudden it was like, well, we have no more money. But by the way, not only do we not have any more money to give you, we're not even going to give you the money we already owe you. So it was like, dude... Like, really? You know, like, um, things are going really good, too. Towards the end, I mean, Circle Dust was getting really big. Yeah. We were starting to get a lot of wind in our sails. Um, radio stations are really beginning to, uh, to, to promote us. And it was just, it was really good, you know? I mean, for, especially for myself being, being like, you know, 22 years old at the time, I was like, dude, you know, I'm going on tour. I'm playing with my friends, you know, it was like, what more could you ask for, you know? And then when it all came to a screeching halt, it was like, you know, and, and the biggest, 90, 95% of that was the label and the fact that they were like, well, look, we just don't have the money and we're actually, we're going bankrupt. I mean, the owner of the label was doing a, a lot of unsavory things, let's just say. So he made a lot of bad business ventures and, uh, you know, he wasn't really wise with his money and stuff, so it just, it was really frustrating to do, like, man, we were coming so far, too, you know, so a lot of, we had a lot of opportunities that we ended up not being able to do really anything with, too, because we had plans, and, you know, we were going to work on another album and stuff, but, you know, yeah. it is it is what it is, so. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Um... What are the best ways for people to support Clank? Um, best way is like, you, I mean, we're on all the social media sites, we're on all the digital streaming sites, but if you go to clanknation.com, there's links to like, if you go to like music and merch, you can hit, uh, you can hit like, uh, our, it's a link to our CD Baby account, our band, uh, band camp account. So like, you know, you can download stuff off iTunes or whatever, but if you go directly to Clank Nation and order from us, that's where we get the most of the, the profit, where we would basically at least get the most for our time and effort, so to speak. Yeah. 
you know, but we're on, like I said, we're on all the, we're on, like, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Flacker, Deezer, uh, Tidal, Google Play, Amazon MP3, YouTube, we're on all those, so I mean, but any, any way you stream music, just add our albums to it, you know, we get like point zero 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 two percent of a penny every time you play a song, so... <laughs> Over time it adds up. That's awesome. Uh, I finally got the chat window back up. And I see if it's Craig Bernard who wants Dallas has your back. Yeah, those are my boys. My local <laughs> boys. I'm glad to see all these people finally because my, my window kept freezing and I couldn't see any of this before. So now I'm I'm seeing uh so now I'm finally seeing everything. Ah, this is awesome. <laughs> Well, uh, that's all the questions I got for you, man. Um, but before you go, could I get you to make a tag for my show? Absolutely, dude. And again, seriously, thank you so much for letting me come on and uh, ramble aimlessly for like an hour about what's, what's new in our world. I really appreciate you giving me and other artists like myself uh, a chance and, and getting an avenue to get their music out and, and to be heard, dude. So on behalf of all the other artists, thank you for what you do and, and all the other DJs that your stations do. We really appreciate it. You know. Yeah. So no, no problem, man. It's actually an honor to have you on here. Uh, but uh, would I be able to get you to like make a, a tag that I could play on my show? Sure, sure. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, whenever you're ready, just say... Uh, this is Clank, and you're listening to DJ Doomslayer on Metal Devastation Radio. And you can add whatever you want to it. It doesn't matter to me. All right. This is Clank, and you're listening to DJ Doomslayer on Metal Devastation Radio. Don't go anywhere. Dude, that is awesome. <laughs> well, thanks for your time, man. Be silly. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on, man. And thank you for everybody in the chat. I'll stick around in the chat for a little bit longer if anybody's going to be up and about. <laughs>